Welcome to the How to Be Awesome at Your Job podcast, the show where brilliant professionals share how to sharpen the universal skills required to flourish at work. Enjoy more career fun, wins, meaning, and money with your host, Pete Mikaitis. Well, I think you're going to enjoy this next guest. Tim Hurston just has tons and tons of wisdom and experience when it comes to facilitating teams coming up with smarter solutions, more creative ideas, both in terms of quality and quantity. And he shares a bunch of great tidbits from that lifetime of experience. So you're going to walk away with one, the no wonder and GPS tools for sparking additional creative ideas Two, the mighty benefits of the third third of your creative ideas, and three, a wonderfully obvious secret to productivity. A bit about Tim. He is the founding partner of ThinkX Intellectual Capital, a firm that provides global corporations with training, facilitation, and consultation in productive thinking and innovation. He's both a faculty member and trustee of the Creative Education Foundation and a founding director of Facilitators Without Borders. To check out the stuff mentioned on the show, some links and transcript, etc., that's over at awesomeatyourjob.com slash ep26. And if you want the goods from Tim Faster in an email you can read in two minutes or less, sign up for the Gold Nugget email list over at awesomeatyourjob.com. Here's Tim. Tim, thanks so much for appearing here on the How to Be Awesome at Your Job podcast. Nice to be here, Pete. Thank you for asking me. Oh, yes, certainly. And, uh, you've got a fun bio, but the thing that really grabbed my attention more than some of the others was that you started this organization, Facilitators Without Borders. That sounds fascinating. Can you tell us a little bit of what's the work that they do? Yeah. yeah. It, you know, it's really interesting. One of the things that I've learned about the way people think, the way people work together is that often people feel that they can, and everybody does it all the time. We have how many meetings do we have, you know, in, mm. in our lives? I mean, the millions. And but very rarely are they actually facilitated meetings. Sometimes there's a boss in a meeting, right. but there's often meetings that people just think that you know this is something that they know how to do because you know what could be more natural, and yet. What I've discovered in my in my professional career is that it makes a huge difference if you can have a facilitator with a certain skill set and a certain attitude set that allows that meeting to function more effectively. So what we did is we took the work that we had been doing for corporations and for institutions and sometimes for governments and started applying that to organizations that – didn't have a lot of money. Facilitators Without Borders literally supplies these people with these particular types of skills to groups that otherwise couldn't afford them. Sometimes it's NGOs of various kinds. Sometimes it could be just community groups. Sometimes it's a group of immigrants, you know, who, who are struggling to try to make a place for themselves in, you know, in an urban setting, for example. How do you talk about these things? How do you really, really begin to solve problems? And one of the things that I've learned is there are two kinds of facilitators. There's one kind of facilitator who at the end of the meeting, you know, let's say it's a business meeting, people walk out of the meeting and they say, whoa, that was a great facilitator. That was really amazing. Uh, Don't want to be that kind of facilitator. I thought I knew where you're going with this. (laughs) (laughs) Where do you want to land? I want the people to say, boy, were we great. Yes. We were fabulous. <laughs> and then there was some guy in the corner there. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good facilitator. Because facilitator isn't about, you know, it's not about you. Right. It's about them. It's not the Tim show. No. Nah, <laughs> no way. So that's a little bit about facilitators with iPod. It's been going for about 10 years now. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Well, so, so I'm glad to hear that, uh, that that resource is available to organizations in need of that. And, and one more thing to maybe kick off the, the content conversation. I'd love to hear your take on, you believe the phrase out of the box thinking should be put back in the box and buried in a deep hole. Tell us about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what happens with with any kind of a fad or, you know, as soon as things get popular, 
people just start repeating these phrases over and over and over. You know, it is how it is, right? Oh, right. <laughs> over and over again. And they lose their meaning completely. So people talk about inside of the box and outside of the box, and they're, 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 just, they're just making noises. They're not talking <laughs> about anything at all. And so I think that, you know, once a phrase gets drained of meaning like that, and I think it does, you know, it's the kind of thing that you spout out at employee meetings or corporate meetings or boardrooms, and you kind of sound like you're talking about creativity or you're talking about innovation. You're not. You're just kind of filling the air. You're filling the space. And so that's one reason. But there's another reason, too, and that is, can you imagine any other serious activity? where you would say, let's take morality or ethics. Mm -hmm. Would you say that, you, you know, you have to go somewhere else as in out of the box to be ethical, to think ethically, to think, let's say, customer service? No, you would want your employees to think ethically, be ethically, have good customer service all the time. Yes, not just inside or outside of a particular box. And it's the same with productive or creative thinking. There's no place for it. It's everywhere. It's part of your life. And I think that there's this notion that you, you know, you go to a creative room, right? Or you go to a creative seminar or you go to a creative session and that's where you should do that kind of work. I think that's nonsense. Uh, we should do it at home. We should do it at work. We should do it while we're driving because it's part of who we are as human beings. Oh, I like that. And that's rock solid. So now when it comes to you, to how we do that. So you've got your productive thinking model. And it sounds like there is a whole lot of, of years of research and experience underlying it in terms of, you said, 50 years with the Creative Education Foundation, 30 years at NASA, five years of field testing. Can you tell us a little bit of, of that backstory? Because it sounds like there is a towering amount of, I guess, productive thinking going into the productive thinking model. <laughs> There is, but I also want to, uh, I'd like to take a step back. You know, there are tons of models out there. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, people have heard of design thinking. People have heard of productive thinking. People have heard of creative problem solving. Uh, there's something called synectics. There's, uh, people may know uh, Dr. Edward de Bono and his hats. six hats methodology. And in fact, he has several. So there's a world of method out there. And one of the most common and highly thought of is the so-called scientific method, you know, where you attempt to disprove a statement. I really don't think it's a function of which method you use. I think the issue really is that in order to think productively, in order to think creatively, there's a structure mm -hmm. that is important. Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, any old structure, I'm not going, going that far, but if you use the, the most basic of, kinds of, of uh, kinds of structures, like what's the problem? What do, you, do I think is causing the problem? What do I think might be some possible barriers to so solving that problem? What do I think I might do to overcome those barriers? Even though that's just literally, I was just counting on my fingers in an off-the-cuff kind of process. If you followed that little unscientific process, you would think better about your problem than if you just kind of daydreamed or sat, or sat there or, you know, just took stabs in the dark. So it's really not about any particular structure so much as it is about structure itself. There's huge value in structure. And it's kind of like it's not a whole lot different from the kinds of structures that we have in athletics. So in what was a 420-something you know, or other, a young man by the name of Pheidippides ran mm -hmm. from Marathon to Athens to report the, the victory of the Athenians over the Phoenicians. And he drops dead. And right. that's why we have a marathon, uh, the name Marathon. But isn't it interesting that today you've got literally almost a million people a year, I think is the last thing that I read running marathons, and they're not young, strapping people. A lot of them are mm -hmm. my age, and they don't drop dead. And one of the reasons they don't drop dead is that we've developed structures around how to run marathons. And anybody who's listening to the podcast, and maybe you, Pete, I don't know, 
if you practice for a marathon, there is a way, there is a structure. You can do a certain amount of uphill and then you do your sprints and then you do your, your endurance and then you might, you know, do some weight training and so on. And, and there's a way that you do this stuff. And as a result of developing this structure, we run marathons better as a race of, you know, of beings. Mm -hmm. it's the same is true with thinking. If you can figure out a decent methodology and apply that structure to your thinking, you can do marathon thinking in kind of the same way as you can do marathon marathons. And it works with music and it works with performance arts and it works with writing and it works with anything. We are learning creatures. And if we could learn how to do things in a productive, efficient manner and then apply that learning, we can do anything. You know, I love that. And that really connects with me as well and, and kind of why I'm in this business. As a child, I would go to the library and I would read a lot of books about a topic. Maybe it's chess. And sure enough, I was playing better chess because I learned some things, some structure. Absolutely. I read some books about uh, photography and I was taking better photos because I, I learned some some structure elements. So, and, and it was quite exciting as a youngster to take away that lesson like, oh, learning and books make you better at things. And so I can learn how to do things and then I become better. That's cool. Make you better. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly. The folks who are listening to your podcast, everyone will have had this experience. And this is like a tiny, tiny example of the, of the power of simple, simple structure. So everybody's had the experience of being in a work environment, or maybe you're, you're at home, or maybe you're doing a school project, and you come up with the, and maybe you're working with a group, and you come up with the best answer to this, this burning you know, problem that you've had and that you can possibly imagine. And you try to apply the answer and nothing happens. Mm. It doesn't change. And what I do is and I call that the great answer, wrong question syndrome. The simple activity of just focusing first on the question and saying, did I really ask the right question here? Or am I kind of fooling myself? And then nailing the question so that once you've got that question clearly defined, you know what you, you're after, then you start thinking about the creative solution to whatever it is. And you have a much higher chance of success. So just the separation, that's it. this is one of the most simple things that anybody could do, is separating the notion of what is the question from what is a possible way out of my pain, whatever that happens to be, so that I can focus on and define the question, get it right, so that then all the other work that I do actually has purpose, actually has meaning, and actually has effect. Oh, that's lovely. Could you maybe give us an example of, of where this often breaks down or does not happen? Well, you know, in, a work, in, in work environments, you know, people you know, are frequently talking about, you know, how are we going to be able to save money? How are we going to increase the bottom line? And very, very often, they will focus on the wrong things. And often it's the low-hanging fruit. So, for example, one of the ways to increase the bottom line is to fire a whole bunch of people <laughs> because, because the, you know, the notion is let's cut costs. But cutting costs may not be the right answer. It could be the right answer, but it may not be the right answer. It could be completely the wrong answer. And in fact, maybe the real answer is you can grow your way out of your financial difficulties. The reverse is also true. Often you have people in entrepreneurial kinds of situations who are absolutely convinced that the answer to their problems is rapid growth. But often you have, particularly in, a, you know, in, a, in an entrepreneurial uh, situation where the cost of producing a good is actually greater than the, than the cost you can recover from selling it, growth is a real problem. Oh, it certainly. Way, right? <laughs> a lot of people in business, many people in business have experienced that thing. So you might be answering the wrong question and actually digging the hole even deeper. Okay, so that's a great principle there. So a clear separation in terms of the, the question versus trying to rush to unanswer, but rather make sure you're getting the, the right answers to the right questions. What are some other kind of key principles or steps to bear in mind with productive thinking? Well, another one is something that I call the third third. And it's, you know, because it sounds kind of interesting. People, oh, trademark it, yeah. It's that's good. The right <laughs> There's some good studies that suggest that in any good ideation session, I like to use the word ideation session as opposed to brainstorming because brainstorming has taken its lumps 
over the years. So I I call them ideation sessions. And an ideation session can be you by yourself, you with, you know, some, you know, a small group of people or a very large group of people working with one another. That in any good ideation session, the first third of the ideas, more or less, are usually not ideas at all. Mm. They're stuff that we know from the past. They're stuff that we've heard from the past. They, they're, they're, they're just like, they're just below the surface, literally, of our skulls. And they're not original. The second third, once you exhaust that first third, are ideas which are a little bit different. They have some potential, but they're not, they're still not terribly adventurous. They're, they're kind of rooted in your experience, your reality, and so on. And it's the third third of those ideation sessions where you kind of like Wiley Coyote, who's run off the edge of the cliff, you know, Mm -hmm. and he's treading water or treading air in the air. There's nothing anchoring you. And that's where the vast majority of creative ideas actually come from. The problem is that we rarely in most business environments and organizational environments get to the third third. I call it satisficing. We satisfice on those first third answers because they kind of take us out of our misery. So let me be explicit here. All right. There was a uh, a client I had some many, many years ago who was in Ohio, and they were glass manufacturing company, so tumbler-style glasses, very inexpensive glasses, the kinds of things you get in in restaurants, greasy spoon restaurants. And they had a problem, and the problem was that they would have these things coming off conveyor belts, and they'd have packers packing them into crates, and they didn't want to use styrofoam to protect the glasses, so they used newspaper. And uh, the workers would, you know, grab a glass from the conveyor belt, wrap it up in paper, and quickly stuff it in a little slot in a box, and they finally fix, fill the whole box. Mm-hmm. Every once in a while, they would have a problem because. The workers would reach for a piece of paper, and usually it was like yesterday's paper, and they'd see a headline, often a sports headline, and it would stop them just for a fraction of a second. And as a result, the conveyor belt keeps going, right? Yeah. And they would have this, you know, catastrophe. And you know, a lot of people have seen the classic old I Love Lucy thing with the chocolate That's factory. exactly what I'm imagining right exactly. now. Exactly. <laughs> That's what was happening to these people. So management gets together and they come up with a whole bunch of first third answers to this question. Uh, let's fire them. Let's, oh. right, let's put closed circuit TV cameras on them. Let's reward them. And none of those are original ideas and none of them are likely to work. So at one point in the session, and we, we kind of, when we do these sessions with, with clients, we, we push and we push and we push and people get a little ticked off. Because they say, I'm giving you all my answers. You know, oh. I, don't have <laughs> I don't want to think anymore. But you push. And some guy in the group there said, well, I know. Let's just poke their damn eyes out. And he was being facetious. He was being, you know, he was fed up. But think about that idea. That idea has buried in it brilliance. Because what happens when you poke people's eyes out? Now, you can't do that. Even in Ohio, that's not allowed. Even in Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> what happens if you if you hire people with with sight problems? They can't see. They cannot be distracted by intriguing headline. Absolutely. And here's the other thing: there are some side benefits that you never even thought of. Like a lot of people who have that kind of an issue are tangent. You know, they have they have tactile sensitivity, which is much greater than people who are sighted. So you might have less general breakage as well. Hmm. And then, of course, you're making a good name for yourself in the community, presumably. And maybe you can even get subsidies for hiring such people. So this one crazy third, third answer becomes actually a wonderful solution. But we don't get there. In most of our ideation sessions, we kind of satisfy on the let's fire them or let's put closer. Oh, yeah, that'll work. (laughs) And we stop thinking. Uh, One of the things I like to say is that, you know, don't let your conclusion be just for you happen to stop thinking. Yeah, it's a kind of a conclusion. But the real conclusion is the one that goes beyond where you stop thinking. So one of the secrets of creativity and the secrets of productivity is it's so basic. It's just do it. It's actually go further than you think you can go. And again, think about sports. 
how does a great athlete become a great athlete? By doing more and going further than they think they can go. But it doesn't have to be just the elite who, do, who does that. Anybody at whatever starting point, you know that you can play a better game of golf. You know that you can run better. Same thing. You know that you can think better. You don't have to be a creative genius like Isaac Newton or Einstein or Da Vinci. Wherever you start, you can get better. Okay. No, that's great. And so I, this notion about pushing it and going after the third third, we did. We have a previous guest, Esteban Gast, and said that the key thing to get more creative ideas is just more time associated with generating those ideas. And largely, there tends to be a dip in the process as we're having an ideation session. Folks are, are putting some things out. And then you said they get aggravated. They say, I don't have any more. That's all I've got. I think what it's really about is if you steep yourself in your problem, you've got all the data and it's just, and you don't have an answer yet, but you've got all the data, you've been looking at it left, right, up, down, you know, whatever, which way, and then just going away sometimes, you know, incubating. One of the things to do is, is not just, is not to, to, uh, to brute force it, to take the, a brute force approach to it, but sometimes to do quite subtle things like, Stopping and literally, you know, smell the coffee, smell the flowers. Another one might be to change your mode of thinking. So you've been approaching the problem from a verbal, logical point of view, which in a business environment, you know, is pretty common. Well, what about trying to approach it from a sensory point of view? What about taking pictures of things and looking at them and saying, how does this picture relate to my problem? Well, a lot of people will say, don't be stupid. That picture doesn't relate to my problem at all. Look at it. Mm -hmm. How does it relate to your problem? It's astonishing what happens when you do things like that. The most simple things. How do you, what would your problem look like if you drew it? What would your problem look like if you could smell it? Try to take a sensory approach. That can often work. And then there's the physical thing. You can't change anybody's mind, I think, unless you can help them change their physical position as well. So right. what about just moving around? What about taking the chairs out of the room? Really? You want to sit down? Don't. <laughs> Just walk. Walk around. Switch seats. One of the, the coolest things that, again, people in, the, in, the, in your, your listening audience can do is go home tonight and have a dinner with your family and just switch seats with everybody. That simple act of switching seats. You sit where your kid sits or the husband and wife change their seats because they're going to see a different table. And by seeing a different table, they'll also get different mental activities moving. Well, that's fascinating. It's so wild as you say that. I'm imagining my childhood home where, you know, fond memories of some family dinners. And I, I just think, well, no, that's my seat. And then what you've said, I was just like, I, I can't even imagine <laughs> sitting at a different seat. So it would certainly spark a different kind of uh, mood, a uh, vibe and, and conversation. Yeah. Well, and the diversity thing too, Pete. I re I just read this recently, and so I, you know, forgive me if this isn't going to be a hundred percent accurate, but it really resonates with me. I read a story about a guy who uh, had done some research, and he discovered not that it's a huge discovery, but he discovered that people in England keep their ketchup, their open ketchup bottles, in different places from. People in North America. People in North America keep their open ketchup bottles in the refrigerator. Yeah, oh, yeah. what do they do? <laughs> That's what I would do, right? People in England put them in the cupboard because, you know, ketchup doesn't really go off. As, <laughs> like it, it takes a long time. Right? So imagine now you are preparing hamburgers, hot dogs, and, you know, some fries for your family. And you reach into the place that you store your ketchup and you discover ketchup bottle empty. If you're looking in the refrigerator, the substitute things that you're going to find for ketchup are very different than the substitute things you're going to find for ketchup if you keep it in your cupboard. So you might go into the refrigerator and say, oh, no ketchup. Maybe I can use some mayo on this, right? Because mm -hmm. that's in the refrigerator too or some mustard or whatever. But in England... The ketchup is next to the malt, the malt vinegar. Hmm. So might I use you know some 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 malt vinegar on my French fries as opposed to ketchup on my French fries? Just because my habit, because of the diversity of you know my culture, is slightly different. 
So now you can take that same principle and you can put a mathematician and a, a painter and a psychologist and an I don't know what else in a room and let them all work on the same problem. They're going to come up with very different approaches. And at first, those are going to be difficult to accept by the others in the group. But if they can defer judgment long enough and really begin to explore these ideas, it could be that the painter comes up with a great solution to the, mathema the mathematician's problem. So that kind of diversity is another great way of increasing the number of ideas, not necessarily because you've increased the time, but because you've changed the process. Oh, that's fun. That's fun. Oh, so these are, these are such great gems that the principles here separate the question and the answer, uh, go after the third third, and so different ways to spark that in terms of different people and activities and incubating and movement. What else you got? Is there an additional principle or tip you'd like to include uh, right in these rosters? Oh my gosh, there really are a lot of them. I'll tell you one of them that I think is really, well, there's, there's two, and one relates to the time thing, so I'll say it, and I'll say it real fast, but then I'll move on. It's, we tend to conflate uh, coming up with ideas and criticizing the ideas. Mm. So, you know, you come up with an idea, and before you've even finished articulating it, somebody will say, oh, well, we tried that, or you'll say that. So just the simple mnemonic, which I use, is called make lists, make choices. So all you do is the first part of your thinking is you just list things. You don't talk about them. You don't say that was this wall is a great idea. You don't go off on tangents. You say, here's a possible solution. Here's another one. 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 You don't even talk about it. You just make the list. Then you go back and you revisit the list. And now you start the very different kind of thinking because there's two different modes of thinking. One is a creative mode. The other is a critical mode. I now make choices. And that critical mode is now applied not to a single idea, but to a whole range of ideas. And it gives you more options. People go into brainstorming sessions. I said I didn't like to use that word, and I just used it. <laughs> People go into brainstorming sessions, and they come out with having talked about it after an hour, one idea. Because, you know, it it's get, gets rolled around and jumbled around in that, in that session. Well, that's not a brainstorm. That's a right. brain drizzle. It's, <laughs> you know, it's like a leak. It's nothing. So just make lists, make choices is a really, really useful way of separating those two kinds of thinking, the creative from the critical thinking. And then the other thing that I was going to say was the way we evaluate. We often evaluate ideas, people, you know, restaurants, movies, you know, whatever, in a very binary way, good, bad, in, out, you know, up, down. But wouldn't it be cool if you could have a tool that allowed you to evaluate ideas in such a way that it wasn't just pass fail, but in the process of evaluating the idea, I actually improved the idea itself. We call that generative judgment. And there's a whole bunch of tools that you can use to do it. I like one that's super simple. I call it GPS. And it stands for good problematic and step ups, spelled step hyphen up. Mm -hmm. And so what it means is I take a look at the idea and I say, what is good? What is great? That's the G about this idea. And I just make a list. Same process I talked about in a minute ago, just make a list. Then I go and I look at it and I say, well, what's problematic with the idea? Well, it'll get us thrown in jail. It'll make us bankrupt. Whatever. <laughs> and I make a list of those. And then you go to the S and the magic is here. You say, how can I take what's good in the idea and step that up to be great? What can I change in the idea to make something that was good in it, in it be absolutely out of sight? So I'm not satisfied with the good. I want it to be great. Same is true with the problem. What can I do to step up the problem from a problem to a possible potential? And all I have to do is that three-step process. What's good? What's problematic? And how do I step up the good to great? And how do I step up the problem to possibility. And now you look at the idea and you say, wow, that is not the same idea that I went in with. I may still reject it. It may still be a bad idea. It won't work. But I have given this thing a real chance. So this generative judgment using, as I said, there's a ton of tools. I happen to like GPS because it's kind of simple that allow you to evaluate ideas in a very different way. That's a huge, huge plus. And leave that phrase, I, I like that generative judgment. It's not just fun alliteration, but it's like judging, not in the sense of what am I going to cut, eliminate now, but rather how can I, I take this and generate further from it? 
exactly. And again, there's always an analogy. <laughs> so the, the analogy here is how do we raise kids, you know, if we do it well? Well, with generative judgment. We say, wow, really good work. Need to work on that. How are we going to make that really good better? And how are we going to work on that? Same process. Same process. Oh, that's great. Well, I feel like we could, we could do this all day, but in, in the interest of time, maybe I'll just ask, is there any other kind of key piece that you want to make sure you get to share before we shift gears and talk about some of your favorite things? Well, there is. You talked about time earlier, and, and I think it's worth revisiting. Everybody wants a quick fix. You know, everybody mm-hmm. wants the magic bullet, the magic potion. Not happening. It's not happening. Creativity or productive thinking, whatever you want to call it, is hard work. It doesn't come from nothing. It isn't a half an hour, you know, to solve the biggest problem your organization has ever had. It really takes work. And unless you realize that it takes work, unless you expect that it will take work, you will be disappointed because you'll have a brainstorming session. You'll say, well, that was a waste of an hour. And it probably was. You know, you're Mm -hmm. right. So you really do have to apply it. It's not, and it comes back to the inside of the box and outside of the box quote too. If you think that creativity or productivity or productive thinking is just this kind of place that you go when you've got a particular kind of a problem and then you'll spend 15 minutes there or 20 minutes or even you know two hours there and then come back and everything will be fine, you're in for a big disappointment. It's right. about work. One of my favorite quotes from the artist Chuck Close. And he says, he says, inspiration is for amateurs. The rest of us just show up yeah, and we do it. And you know that as an entrepreneur yourself, you know, forget inspiration. It's great if it comes wonderful, but it's the slog that does it for you. It's doing the work, doing the work, doing the work. Perfect. Thank you. Well, so so now let's shift gears a little bit and, and hear about some of your favorite discoveries along the way with your work and consulting and, and just living life. Could you start us off by sharing a favorite quote, something that you've thought about or found yourself repeating again and again? Admitting that you're wrong. Wow, that is so powerful. You know, admitting you're wrong is just that you were, that you were wrong. It's just like saying, you know, I'm smarter now than I was then. Oh. And, and the converse, of course... <laughs> It's that not admitting that you're wrong. It's like, I'm just as dumb now as I was then. Oh, that's fun. You know, how much of life have people missed? All of us, I think, to some, to some extent. Because we had to be right. We had to be right. We've thrown away relationships. We've thrown away opportunities. We've thrown away maybe love. Because we had to be right. Oh, who needs that? That's profound. Thank you. How about also a favorite uh, study or piece of research you cite often? (laughs) There's a guy by the name of Goran Ekfal. Thank you for asking because, you know, one doesn't think about these things. So that's kind of an adventure to to jump into. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for tackling it. A guy by the name of Goran Ekval. Ekval is a Swede, I believe. And uh, he, he did a study in the, I believe it was the 60s. And he measured creativity, and I can't even tell you how, so I'm not 100%, you know, on it, but he measured creativity in very, very young children, I think up to the age of four. And he, and he gets a result that something like, you know, 95% of these kids are creative. And then he takes the same cohort, it's a longitudinal study, he takes the same cohort when they're 10 years old, and he finds out that 30 some odd percent are creative. And then he goes to early teenage and he finds that five percent are creative and these numbers aren't right they're but they're notional they're directional and then he goes to adults and they're like two of two percent are creative and i love that study because what happened here did their brains disintegrate no something else happened and i think what it is that's happened is that they've lost the ability to do some of the things that we've just been talking about you know here they've lost the ability to be wrong They've lost the ability to maybe have wonder. Like, isn't, isn't wonder a great thing? I love no one. One of my favorite tools, and I know I'm jumping away from your question. No, take it. But, I, but I want Do to it. talk about this other tool. It's called no wonder. It is the best tool. It's the simplest tool. You take any issue, any problem, anything that's bugging you, and you make a little T-square diagram, you know, that famous left side, right side thing. And on the left side, you say, what do I know about it? And you list all the stuff. And the right side, you say, what do I wonder about it? And I should know about it, but I don't. 
And just by doing this, either by yourself or with a whole bunch of people, you suddenly start seeing this issue in a totally different way than you saw it at first. So super simple tool, but a great tool. No K-N-O-W and wonder, W-O-N-D-R. It's that kind of thing, again, that we don't do enough. Oh, thank you. No wonder. And how about a favorite book, uh, one of your favorites that you've enjoyed? I love stuff. But I'll tell you some stuff that I've read recently that I really have gone crazy with. There's a guy by the name of China Mieville, who's a British writer. You look at him, he looks like a biker, and he's like got holes all over his body. And he's, but, but the guy is absolutely brilliant. Uh, he's written a book called, he's done quite a few books, it's kind of science fiction-y stuff. This one's called The City and the City. And uh, if anyone has an opportunity to read this, it is just a mind-blowing book, The City and the City. And the story is real brief. It's about two cities which actually occupy the same space, but they're different countries and different cities, and they have to be careful of how they behave. And it's a sort of a crime mystery that occurs in this weird kind of, but, but once he explains it to you, I can't do it in, in, you know, in just two sentences. Once he explains it to you in the book, you can, you can, you can be there. You can say, Oh, I can see how that would happen. Cause it kind of does happen in many ways. You know, we have so many separate realities that we live in, in our normal lives. Great book, China Mieville, British writer. Oh, intriguing, intriguing. And how about a personal habit or practice of yours that you found helps your productive thinking personally? I got to come back to the shower. And I'm not being facetious there because, you know, I do go into the shower and, and uh, like many people, I guess what, I think what happens is that your, your critic just turns off in the shower, mm-hmm. you know, and you're allowed to think all these things that you don't allow yourself to think. But the other one is, and, and maybe the more useful one, is this issue of application that we talked about before, and that is, you know, do the work. So I'm working on a, on a book now, fiction book, actually. It's my, my first fiction book. And I've developed the habit of waking up in the morning and not doing anything before I start writing for a couple of hours, just, you know, in, in notebooks. And then what I'll do is I'll later transcribe that, that material. And I've discovered, you know, there's this great, great story, apocryphal probably story, about uh, the physicist Richard Feynman. You know, one of his friends once asked him, clearly you're a genius, Richard. How do you do it? What's your secret? And he said, Richard Feynman says, uh, well, first I write down the problem, then I think very hard, and then I write down the answer. (laughs) But it's the same thing with the book that I'm working on. I'll have a problem with a character or a situation. I don't know where the story is going to go. I literally, on that piece of paper, I say, what's going to happen to, to, uh, to J.D., one of the characters? And then I start writing the answer. And it actually works. I skip the thinking very hard part. <laughs> but I, I literally, I just write the answer. And eventually stuff happens. Stuff comes. It's part of the discipline of doing it. Uh, that daily, daily discipline. It's amazing. We always, one of the other things you know, that you talk about, you know, personal learnings and experiences, we often so overestimate what we can do in the short term and underestimate what we can do in the long term. It's just chipping away at it. You can make miracles. Thank you. And how about a, a fan favorite item that you share, like when you share it, put people retweet it or they start taking notes vigorously or in your book, there's a, a lot of Kindle highlights. What, what are some of those quotable gems of your own origin? One of the things that people uh, really like is uh, the thing about that I mentioned earlier about uh, not admitting you've made mistakes. Well, the other one that people seem to relate to is uh, uh, what I call the path you know. The path you know is the safe path, but it also takes you to the place that you've already been. And it's the path you don't know that is the scary path, it's the frightening path, but it takes you to those new places. Yeah, that's one of them. It's one that resonates with me and people come back and, and talk about that with me. And I suppose another one is that I, I you know, I, we, talked, we, we opened up our conversation with this issue of the box. Me, I say there is no box. There, there's no box. And once you get rid of the idea that there's a box, it's actually quite liberating. 
Well, Tim, this has been so fun. Tell us if folks want to learn more about you and want to find you or reach out to you, where should they go? Best place is timherson.com. That's my name, T-I-M-H-U-R-S-O-N.com. There is an organization that I run, a not-for-profit called Mind Camp. That's M-I-N-D-C-A-M-P. That's a .org after that. And that's a creativity retreat that I run every year. About 250 people from all over the world come and we try to, we do it as a not-for-profit. So it's, so it's relatively inexpensive. Those are the two, the two best places. I've got a couple of books out. One is called Think Better. Uh, a lot of the stuff that we've talked about here. Another one is called Never Be Closing and it's about sales and it's about applying the principles of productive and creative thinking to an ethical sales process. And soon there's going to be a book coming out called Praxis, which is about uh, improving performance in any sphere. Again, using a lot of the principles that we've just talked about. Oh, that's fun. Never be closing. Very clever name. <laughs> a, always be. B, C, closing. Always you be closing. got it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's also a network, NBC. That's yeah. fun. And, and any sort of final parting words or challenge or call to action for those seeking to be more awesome at their jobs? Well, I, yeah. Uh, it goes to this, this issue that I mentioned just now, uh, Praxis. A lot of people talk about the North Star. You know, the North Star is that one, that one goal. Uh, over the years, I've become kind of disabused of the idea of a North Star. I think that we have multiple reasons for doing things and that it's really useful to figure out what those multiple reasons are. So I do it because I want to make money. I do it because whatever it is. It's not just one thing. There's usually a three-tiered thing. And the, th- the three tiers are one is status. And status is, you know, how much money do you have? You know, how famous are you? It's this big social kind of goal that people have. The second one is relationships. You know, how do I function in terms of that smaller circle, the tighter relationships in my life, the people I work with, my family and so on? You know, what do I want to do in terms of those things? And then the third one is the the intrinsic one. You know, what is it that makes me that turns me on, that just really just lights my fire. And it's usually a balance of those things. And it doesn't mean when I say balance, I don't mean it's a, I don't mean they all have the same weight, but there's a dynamic in there. You know, what it really is more important to me. Because one of the things that I found is whether it's about solving problems or performing well in a business context or in an athletic contest, all of them, again, this is all comes full circle again, Pete, because there's so much work involved in any kind of a successful activity, because there's so much failure involved in any kind of successful activity, because there's so much pain involved in it. You've got to have enough motivation to get through that stuff. The unbelievable amount of work, the unbelievable amount of frustration, the unbelievable amount of pain. And unless you know yourself well enough, you're going to give up. You're not Mm. going to be able to follow through. Wow. Thank you. That's that powerful, powerful final thought. Tim, this has been so much fun. Uh, Thanks for making this time and good luck in all your creative and productive thinking. Well, thank you, Pete. And uh, let's talk again because uh, I'd, I'd like to sort of turn the tables on you and oh. ask you all the questions. Oh, I'd too. be happy to. Thanks. <laughs> Hopefully you've already got some better ideas to handle some stuff, some problems that are showing up in your world. Again, if you want to check out the show notes, the transcript, things mentioned, that's at awesomeatyourjob.com slash F26. Peace out. Thanks for joining us for today's episode. To get the most out of this conversation, visit awesomeatyourjob.com to find today's show notes, transcript, and infographic summary cheat sheet. For more entertaining professional skill sharpening, be sure to subscribe to catch the next episode of How to Be Awesome at Your Job. 